Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today here. Uh, we're going to get started in just a second. We always want to give uh, people a few extra minutes to join in, so sit tight. Uh, we'll go ahead and get started in just a couple minutes. Okay, thanks everyone for joining us today. We're going to go ahead and run through some live sites for Hawk Search. We're going to show you some experiences of how Hawk Search is able to help improve the B2B experience, specifically with an eye towards how, uh, with our new Salesforce Lightning B2B Commerce Connector, we can really help provide the best experience for those Salesforce Lightning uh, B2B Commerce clients. Uh, let's go ahead and get started here. I want to go ahead and share my screen. Uh, we'll go ahead and uh, make sure that you guys can see what I'm seeing here. Let's go ahead and jump over to our first demonstration site here. So what we really want to walk through when we start talking about what functionality Hawk Search can bring to the table, looking towards Salesforce B2B commerce and understanding some of the limitations that we see there, really with an eye towards this search functionality and what can we help improve there. I wanted to start with Berlin Packaging, really give an example of some of the core functionality when we think about site search. What does that mean, especially in this B2B context? Because it's a very different experience from what we see in the commerce space and kind of just that B2C experience. There's a different kind of expectation from the search uh, tool. So for Berlin, I wanted to start with something really basic. We want to say that we're looking for something uh, pretty straightforward. Let's say that I'm looking for, now Berlin Packaging there carry uh, jars, bottles, things like that. Uh, if I say I'm looking for, let's just say a glass jar. Now, of course, Hawk Search is powering in the autocompleter. We'll touch on this a little bit deeper as we move into some of the other examples. But to begin with, let's just go ahead and start talking about the search functionality here. So let's finish off that search. Let's say I'm looking for that glass jar. I'll go ahead and execute that search. We'll go ahead and pull back in our results for that term. Now, of course, we pulled back in the relevant results here. This is a pretty straightforward search. You would expect this functionality from really any kind of site search solution that you might be looking at. But just to kind of prove the point here, if we scroll through these results, these are, of course, all glass jars that you're seeing here from these results. What we really see more in the B2B space, and something that I really want to kind of tackle right out of the gate here when we start talking about how, how, how Hawk Search can help in this regard, is really talking about those long tail keyword searches, those searches that use a lot of attribution. Uh, it's, you know, if someone does come to a site and uses a keyword search, what we really see more commonly than anything else is that there's not going to be just a simple two keywords that they're using. It's going to be several keywords that they're trying to really drill into what they're looking for. So as an example to kind of prove that point here, we've done this more generic search for glass jar. Uh, we are driving the facets and filters here. This is other function that Hawk Search can offer. So we can do things like color swatches like you're seeing here. I can say that I'm looking for an amber colored jar, make that selection. We'll build out that breadcrumb. We will, of course, refine the results there. I can then also say that I'm looking for a particular size glass jar. Let's say I'm looking for a two ounce glass jar on capacity. And what we'll see here is this is actually pulling back in uh, several results. What we're actually seeing is 13 different results here within this experience. And what this is going to let us do is we see here, we have 13 results being returned. Uh, what we can do here now is we can do the same kind of search uh, using the same attribution that we just used from a navigation perspective. So I can say instead of doing a generic search and using the facets and filters to refine, Hawk Search can fully support the ability to index and, and understand the data in those attribution fields that really helps us drive long tail keyword searches. So I can say that I'm looking for a two ounce amber glass jar, and we'll go ahead and execute that search and pull back in those results. And it's gonna be the same 13 results that we just saw if I had done the generic search and use the facets and filters to navigate through that. So what we see there is that this is really something that we can take advantage of all the different data points that someone might have around their product catalog, including those more complicated attributes, ounces, colors, and being able to pull back in, again, the relevant right results for that keyword search there. As we scroll through, these are all two ounce amber colored glass jars because we're under, able to understand what those data points are. We're able to look at those fields in terms of driving relevancy. We're able to understand that and make sure that when someone does those longer tail keyword searches that we're able to go ahead and drive the relevant results for that. Now, there's some other things that we want to talk, talk about when we start thinking about kind of relevancy and, and what those results might be because we also know, thinking about this from the B2B perspective, that 
really keyword searches are important. You want to make sure that you can tackle those, that when someone does come to your site and uses that search box to put in those terms and they're looking for that complex technical details, that we can support that. But really what we see more often than not in the B2B space is part numbers or SKU number searching. So let's go ahead and move on to another example here. Let's go ahead and move off of Berlin packaging and let's move over to Kirby Risk, electrical supply, who's using Hawk Search to drive their search functionality as well. And we could do keyword searches here, as you can see from their, their search box, they're calling attention to the fact of what we're trying to get at here, that we can search by catalog number, brand, part number, Kirby Risk part number, or even the UPC and barcode. So any of those pieces of data we can use as a search point in Hawk Search to pull back in the relevant results. But it's not just the ability to search across multiple different fields of data. What's important in the B2B space is that how people search on part numbers can be dramatically different from user to user. So as an example here, let's go ahead and pull back in some results. Let's say I'm looking for some copper wire. And actually something else to note here, let me back up here. Let's talk a little bit about this, this autocompleter because I think this can help uh, really kind of explain some of the other functionality that we're going to see uh, that's important when we start talking about keyword searching and part number searching. The autocomplete here within Hawk Search really does help drive uh, you know, remove some of the friction of that uh, that customer journey. We want this to be kind of as streamlined as possible, let the visitor get to exactly what they're looking for as quickly as possible, and really kind of help guide them through that process as well. The search results that we're seeing here as I start to interact with this search box is autocomplete, is coming from within Hawk Search. There's a lot of machine learning here in terms of tracking suggestions for popular searches, what your top categories are. We're also displaying the most relevant product matches. We're basically making a very quick call to Hawk Search and saying, what would these results be? and return them and display them here within the autocomplete. So as I'm typing this in, you can see that this is of course updating well, what are the popular searches, what are the top categories, and of course also updating our product matches. And that means that when I type in a search and I say I'm looking for copper wire, we can also see this as a popular search, as a cop, uh, category, and we're of course seeing the relevant results there for some green wire, some white wire, some black wire. And if I go ahead and actually execute that search for copper wire, We'll go ahead and pull back in the results here and we can see it is the same set of results. Our green wire, our white wire, our black wire. So that autocomplete is really heavily tied into the experience, not only in terms of making suggestions for what other visitors have searched on, those popular searches, helping guide visitors to the categories that they might be looking for, but also making sure that we're really tied into the product display that's going to be returned and making it consistent. And that has a benefit when we start talking about this from a part number search as well. Let's actually go into a product detail page here and let's show you what we're talking about because there's a lot of detail that we can search on around this. Specifically for this Southwire uh, product here, we have this part number, this THHN-STR-12-GRN-CU-500FT. It's a very long part number. There's numbers and letters. There's special characters in there as well. And how someone might search in this can be different from visitor to visitor. And in the past, what you needed to do is you needed to kind of account for all of those variations. You needed to provide that search tool. Well, here's how the part number is listed. Here's how the part number looks without special characters. Here's how the part number looks with spaces. Here's how basically all of those variations. And it became very data heavy for, you think about you know each individual product that you have, this one part number might need to be entered four different times to say nothing of the other pieces of data that you might wanna search on. Well, within Hawk Search, we are able to look at the individual fields of data and are able to use those to then say, well, we know this is a part number. And because we know this is a part number, we can then say we want to go ahead and look at that differently than how we might look at the name of the product or the short description of the product or the attribution of the product, what's the size of it or the length of it or the diameter, all those other values. We can look at that part number field and understand this is an important piece of data that we want to treat differently. So for Kirby Risk, they're giving Hawk Search just this one piece of data that we see listed here, this THHN, as we're seeing it displayed. And of course, that means that I can then go ahead and search on that exactly as it's listed here. And you can see another benefit of that autocomplete, like I was talking about there, is that because this is just querying the Hawk search engine, as I'm making those requests, we're able to see that accurate result being returned here within the autocomplete. Again, removing that friction, if this was the product that I'm looking for, I don't even need to actually execute the search at this point. I can select the result from here and get directly to this product detail page, streamlining that process. But this is, of course, typing in the part number exactly as it's entered. What we want to be able to do here is I'd be able to also support if someone was to come in and say, you know what, I'm actually just looking for this product without any of those special characters. Again, the benefit here within Hawk Search is that from the Kirby Risk side, there was no need to provide this data to us in several different formats. They're giving us just the part number as we're still seeing it listed here, but we're able to search on it. Hawk Search understands that within this part number, this field of data needs to be looked at differently. And so we're able to strip out those special characters and return that product regardless of how the visitor searches on it. I can even put in you know, spaces instead. Let's say, you know, I want to go ahead and say that I'm looking for this as 
THHN space, STR space, 12, and so on. And again, you can see that we are continuing to return in the relevant product, regardless of how I've searched on that. And the other thing to highlight here is that it's not just this one part number. One of the other things that we commonly see in the B2B space is, of course, part numbers are kind of one of the primary ways that visitors search on it, and the various ways that people search on it is important. We can tackle that, as we've just shown you here. But the ability to search on multiple pieces of, of part numbers, different kinds of part numbers. Again, Kirby Risk is a great example of how Hawk Search is able to handle that. So moving beyond just the kind of listed part number here, the manufacturer part number, there is, of course, that Kirby Risk part number. If we go ahead and take that and use that in the search box, Again, you can see two things, actually. One, that we're getting the exact product match that we're seeing here, but we're also seeing this as a popular search. Something else to note about Hawk Search and this autocomplete, when we're talking about kind of ways that we can help streamline the, the functionality and remove some of that friction, is we do bring a lot of automation and machine learning to the table. So as we're seeing here for this popular search suge suggestion of 560957, this is actually other searches that visitors have executed on the site. This is a common way that people are looking for this. And Hawk Search has learned from that experience. So if I start to back this up and say that I was looking maybe for 560, we can see that we are still making suggestions for other part numbers to help the visitors kind of really quickly refine into what they're looking for uh, from that search perspective. This is being learned based off of how often we're seeing those searches, how many unique users are making those, over what period of time are we seeing those searches, all of those different kind of criteria we're using to then in inform, well, what are the popular searches? So it doesn't just need to be keywords that we're seeing be suggested there as a popular search. We can, of course, also make suggestions for part numbers. But again, this just proves out our ability to search across multiple pieces of data, not just the part number that we have listed from the manufacturer, your own internal part number, or of course, even UPCs. I can throw this into the search box. And again, we can see that we're going to go ahead and get that same part number being returned here. So multiple pieces of data, special characters and no special characters, the length doesn't uh, impact Hawk Search. Something else that's kind of unique is if we actually only put in partial match on this, let's say I remove those last couple parts there and I search that piece of data. And something else that Hawk Search can do is say, hey, well, we know what you were looking for and make that did you mean suggestion so that the visitor can find exactly what they were looking for when making that search. So we really do kind of help tackle that functionality of we know that within the B2B space, what is commonly an issue is not just being able to search on keywords, being able to search on those long tail technical attribution based keywords, but also from the part number perspective, one of the common ways that we see in the B2B space is that part number searching and all the various data points that someone might be looking for and searching on that. So when we start thinking about how, you know, just kind of the core search functionality, we were very confident in Hawk Search being able to come into the Salesforce opportunity here into the, the B2B Lightning experience and be able to go ahead and really improve kind of the out of the box search functionality. Really those core functionalities that you'd be looking for, that keyword search, part number search, and be able to bring that to the table and help kind of check that box for you. There are some other things to highlight that we do drive, of course. I mentioned this on Berlin packaging when we were moving through the kind of quick facet selection there. We are driving the facets and filters when we're looking at this experience here. And this is, of course, always going to be dynamic and informed based off of the data that we're pulling in from the Salesforce Lightning backend. So we do have a connector that is available in the Salesforce uh, B2B, uh, sorry, the, the Salesforce app marketplace. Uh, Hawk Search is listed within there. We can go ahead and be a part of that, that back end, pull the data basically from your Salesforce environment, your B2B Lightning environment, indexed into Hawk Search. And that basically means any of the data points that you have access to, we can use for that search functionality we've just been highlighting. But we can also drive your facets and filters here within this experience to say, if someone's doing the search for copper wire, we want to make sure that you're presenting the right ability for them to facet and filter within that experience to find specifically what they're looking for. And that can mean things like having amperage rating, conductor size, number of conductors and so on, facets based off of the data that we're having access to from that Salesforce back end. All of this functionality is also coming from within Hawk Search. So the ability, we're not limited in terms of the number of facets or filters that we can provide. You can also see a number of different kinds of options that are being presented here. We have the ability to expand and collapse within these values. We have the ability to uh, scroll within our facets here. We can go ahead and search within our facet values as well. Uh, the facets can start off as a, in a collapsed fashion to begin with versus an expanded facet selection. So lots of control over how that facet navigation begins. And of course, if you do make selections from this, just like we showed you on Berlin Packaging, as you make those selections, we do go ahead and build out those breadcrumb functionalities and refine the results within that. One other thing I want to touch on when we start thinking about this from kind of core functionality that Hawk Search brings to the table to help really improve kind of the, the baseline search that you would get is that we're also layering a lot of machine learning. 
So in addition to kind of our ability to really make sure that regardless of what the visitor is looking on, if it's a part number, if it's a long tail keyword and pulling back in the right relevant results, being able to drive really dynamic and, and in-depth facets and filters with a variety of functionality there, we do also make sure that we're helping streamline the results themselves. So we've done a search for copper wire. We've refined within that THHN type. As we're looking through these results, of course, this is all going to be relevant to that copper wire and that THHN type. But within this experience, we're also learning what the visitors are doing with these results. So there's a lot of machine learning and automation. It's not just that autocomplete that we're using to help improve the experience. With that machine learning in the search results, what we're able to do is learn from the visitors. And this works in a couple of different experiences here. So the first thing that we're doing is we're looking at, well, you've done this search for, for copper wire. We're pulling back in the relevant results for that. Uh, but what are visitors doing with these results? So a lot of other, you know, kind of baseline entry search providers will say, oh, we're going to do that kind of click tracking. We're going to understand, oh, this has been selected 100 times or this has been selected 50 times. And so we're going to move those items that are selected more toward the top. And that's a good kind of first step. But Hawk Search, we really want to go beyond kind of that baseline, oh, it's been clicked a lot. Let's move it toward the top. We wanted to really understand the intent of the visitors because the experience has changed as visitors have become more mature and search has become more important as part of the experience. What we've learned is that if someone does a search for copper wire, they're only going to really look at the first two or three rows of results before they move on, before they hopefully start then using the faster filters or before they maybe try and do a different search or maybe move on to a different site. So with Hawk Search, understanding that functionality, that, that the visitors' mindsets is if they're not seeing the result that they're looking for within the first few products, it's really the, the interaction starts to drop off. We really want to understand, well, when visitors are getting further into the experience, when they are moving further down into the results and making a selection, that is giving us a much more important signal that these results might need to be improved. So in the example here, we've done that search for copper wire. We're pulling back in all of the relevant results for that. But maybe what I end up doing is I end up scrolling all the way down here towards the bottom and I make a selection for this red stranded copper wire. Hawk search will learn from that engagement, but it's not just this has been selected. We're learning where was that result when it was selected. And other signals like how often is this happening over what period of time. If your business is in a seasonal kind of uh, experience, we can uh, treat that as an important metric as well. But what we do is we really look at where the result is when it's being selected. And the fact that this is so much further down in the results is really indicating to us that this is something that someone had to go looking for. And that indicates to us that this should probably be more higher up within the results. And then the other thing that we do is we don't just move something from the bottom of the result all the way towards the top. We want to find what the natural relevancy should be using what your visitors are telling us. And so we'll use that and say, well, this result here, this has been interacted, let's say, 100 times. 100 visitors have scrolled all the way to the bottom of this first page of results and made a selection for the very last item on this page. That tells us this shouldn't be down here at the bottom. And what we'll do is we'll automatically, using that machine learning, all of those other signals, say this shouldn't be down here at the bottom. Let's go ahead and move that more towards the middle of the results. And what we usually find then, because again, as we're talking about that, that mindset has changed of your visitors. When we move an item that is more visible, it now becomes more easily discoverable when they're closer to the top of the results, we normally start to see that become interacted with even more. Now that this is easier to discover, those 100 people who are kind of the trailblazers and went all the way down to the bottom, or they're helping out the rest of the people who come to the site afterwards. And we start to see then that those people that are now able to find this a little bit easier, well, they're starting to engage with it. And so we can continue to see that improvement of the ranking of that result of saying this is actually an important result well then we'll take it from the the bottom of the results that's now been moved to the middle of the results and we can move it all the way toward the top of the results then the second or the third or, or maybe even that very first spot based off of that machine learning and again this is automatically happening as a business one of the things that we want to help uh, improve is that with hawk search there's all this additional functionality that you can get but we want to make sure that it's a very hands-off approach that, you know, knowing that B2B experience, knowing the complexities of the B2B environment, we want to make sure that those keyword searches, those part number searches, that's all handled as part of kind of the core relevancy and indexing setup within Hawk Search. With the results themselves, there's going to be hundreds of thousands of searches that happen on your site. You can't really look at every one of them. So we want to use that machine learning to help automatically improve the ranking of those results that you don't have time to look into from merchandising or from a relevancy perspective. Your visitors are going to tell us what's important with those. And this interaction, this popularity that we're talking about here is really just the first level of what we offer from that automation perspective. From a secondary perspective, we're then looking at, of course, the other important pieces of commerce, which is going to be, are they adding it to their cart? Are they then converting off of that? And that's actually two separate levels of machine learning. 
we look at that as a, you know, when I click into the product detail page, or maybe I click the add to cart button here from the search results, that's a separate signal to Hawk Search to say, not only was I interested in this, I was thinking about purchasing this. And we can treat that as a much more important signal. So going back to our earlier example of that red uh, stranded wire down here at the bottom, maybe 100 people look at this, but only, you know, 10 people actually convert and or 10 people add it to cart and only five people actually convert off of it. Important signals, we definitely would track that in. But let's say we scroll up a little bit further and this uh, this white wire, this white stranded copper wire, you know, only 20 people selected this, but 19 then added it to cart and 19 actually converted off of it. That's a much more important signal to us that this is something that should be treated, uh, it should be moved higher towards the top of the results much more quickly using that different levels of machine learning to understand not only was it selected, but it was then added to cart. It was then actually converted off of. Using that information, we can much more quickly move that white stranded copper wire towards the top of the results there. Additionally, something else that we are offering is the personalization. So something that we do see in the B2B space is the idea of having different kinds of clients. You might have some federated results and Hawk Search can fully support that. We'll show you an example here in just a second. But we can also drive the experience where we're talking about. We know that it's John Smith who's on the site and John Smith is always going to be buying a particular brand name versus Susan Smith who's now on the site and Susan's always looking for different kinds of products. We can use the signals that they're giving us. What products are they searching for? What attributes, what, what facets and filters are they selecting? What products are they looking at? What products are they adding to their cart and converting off of to build out a personalized profile? Uh, in the example here of copper wire, maybe there is a color preference. Maybe our business is uh, always using green copper wire or always using red or always using blue. Well, based off of the purchases that I've made in the past, the searches that I've used, the facets and filters, it could learn that as I'm browsing the site, I've always bought blue copper wire in the past. When I do the search for copper wire, not only is it going to have that core relevancy, not only are we then going to influence this based off of the popularity, the add to carts, and the conversion information, but we're also going to do another pass and say, well, we know that Jonathan's browsing the site here. Let's go ahead and take this blue copper wire and move that more towards the top for him. But we mentioned there the ability for Hawk Search to support segmentation. So something else that's important that we commonly run into in the B2B space and something that we've put a lot of effort to kind of bake into the core functionality of Hawk Search is this idea of segmentation, of federation, of uh, the ability to drive different results based off of what the visitor is. And for that example here, let's go ahead and change sites here. So we, we uh, let's jump over to another example here. Let's jump over to State Electric Supply. So we work a lot in the electrical distribution space. Again, just really one of our strengths in that space where Hawk Search can drive accurate results. We're familiar with this space and it runs into a very common use case that we see of different availability based off of who uh, or where you might be looking for, what your account is and so on. So the example here, we're looking at the electric supply. I'm going to go ahead and actually, let's go ahead and do this search for sensors that I've got here in the box. You can see again, just a different, different experience here for that autocomplete. Again, we won't always want to highlight that the, the tool is not a one size fits all solution. We do understand that every business has different UI considerations. We don't want this to look like a, a third party integration. We want this to look like it is a part of your site. So you can see that every site that we've visited so far has had a slightly different look and feel for that autocomplete based off of what their needs are. In this example here, though, let's go ahead and actually execute that search for sensors and pull back in our results here. And you can see that we're pulling back in 804 results. Now, the interesting thing here about this set of results is you can also see that we have a warehouse associated with us here. We're currently assigned to the Huntington Warehouse as my location. Now, I'm actually not based out in Huntington. I'm out here in the Chicagoland uh, area in Illinois. Uh, so this is kind of the default, you know, here's the, the base warehouse, the, their, their main warehouse that they start with. Now, these results are being influenced by, by that, that location that we have assigned to us. We've done a search for sensors. We're pulling back in 804 results. But if you look over here at the left-hand navigation, there's two things that I want to call attention to. We have the category of Alan Bradley, which has assigned 589 results out of these 804. So more than half of them are from that Alan Bradley. And if you're familiar with the electrical dis distribution space, you know that the Alan Bradley is actually under the Rockwell Automation brand. It is a, a sub-brand of the Rockwell Automation main brand there. So you can see again that we have the 589 results associated with the Rockwell Automation. Now, what's interesting here for State Electric Supply is that they don't carry the Allen Bradley brand universally across their warehouses. So if I was to say, you know what, actually, I'm not from Huntington. I'm out here in Illinois. I want to go to the closest Illinois warehouse. This is going to change the segmentation within Hawk Search. This is going to change the what we call our visitor targeting. But this uh, another way to think of this is, again, just that user segmentation to say, we know, okay, I want to look at this from the Marion warehouse. Well, that changes the information from the Hawk Search end. You can see now that we have 308 results that are being returned, not our 800 plus, because we no longer have Alan Bradley being returned as a category. 
and you can see there as I've typed that in now to search within that category, we're no longer returning it. We also no longer have Rockwell Automation returned as a manufacturer. We've removed those 500 plus results because they're not available at this Marion warehouse location. So the search is able to support the different warehouse availability. And this doesn't need to just be tied to warehouse availability. This can be, I'm logged in and I'm a government customer and so I have access to a different set of my results. I am logged in, I am a small business and so I have access to maybe a different set of catalog that the government customer would see. This is a real clear example of how Hawk Search can drive that kind of federated, uh, segment, segmented uh, results that we're seeing here uh, from within this experience. And what's neat about this is it actually even ties into the search box now. Now that I'm from, now that it knows that I'm from the Marion location and I'm in Illinois and that Alan Bradley is no longer available to me, if I start to say that I'm looking for Alan Bradley, you can see we're not even making suggestions there. So really able to drive kind of a, the experience consistently across the, the entire search functionality. We can take that segmentation. We can make sure that the results are going to be accurate to the segment that we have assigned. That the fasts and filters are going to also under, understand that segmentation. And that even the autocomplete will also understand that and no longer make suggestions understanding that segmentation. Now, this is a really clear kind of example of doing this search from a warehouse location. I want to jump over and show you an example of how we can do this from within a login. So another thing that we see very commonly in the B2B space is the fact that maybe your, your, your search functionality is not actually exposed and available for the public to come in and just browse. MRC Global is a great example of both a Salesforce client using Hawk Search and a client that has their search primarily behind login. Now, they've been thankful, uh, gracious enough to us to give us a, a login that we can actually uh, play around with and see some of the functionality here. So I have logged into the search here. You can see that I am logged in up here at the top. And then this allows me then to be able to do keyword searches that I might want to, uh, you know, go ahead and look for. So let's say that I'm looking for, uh, you know, just a steel elbow here. Again, the autocomplete going to go ahead and drive that functionality. We're pulling back in product matches, category matches, even manufacturer suggestions. So again, thinking about how we can really kind of tackle what your specific needs are for your industry. For MRC Global, they wanted to make sure they're pulling back in, of course, product matches. Uh, but we're also making suggestions for categories and also manufacturers. So I've typed in steel elbow. Obviously, steel elbow is not a part of the manufacturer name that we're seeing here. It is a result of the, the products that are going to be returned. So Hawk Search understands here are the manufacturers that are going to be returned as part of this search term. We can go ahead and display those as part of the autocomplete. So if a visitor is looking for a specific kind of manufacturer for the keyword search that they provided, they can go ahead and make that selection directly from this autocomplete and get to that experience there. If we go ahead and actually execute that search for steel level, we'll go ahead and pull back in the results here. And these results can be filtered against my personal accounts. So the fact that I've logged in, what I'm seeing here can be different from what another visitor that is is logged in. I can also, of course, do that same kind of warehouse availability. If you notice over here, I can filter based off of what my, my default warehouse is. So not only can my core catalog be filtered against the fact that I've logged in or not logged in, but I can also then, of course, filter that information against what my uh, warehouse, my default warehouse might have been assigned as. And you can see I've made that selection for in stock, and that's taken us down to just 12 available items from my default warehouse that I've assigned there. But MRC Global is unique for a couple of different things. So not only being a great example of that Salesforce integration with Hawk Search and really being able to drive search results behind the login, they're also using Hawk Search for one of our more unique search functionalities that I really think is a very important part of what we can bring to the table from a B2B perspective. What can we help solve for Salesforce B2B Lightning clients? And that's going to be unit of measurement conversion. So in the B2B space, one of the more common things that we see is that your product catalog might have a variety of different data points and how someone searches on those. Similar to kind of how we talk about part numbers, where you could have a special character, might not have a special character, might put spaces in there, numbers, letters, so on. There's all that variation. We see the same thing when visitors start talking about how they search on uh, unit of measurements. So as a quick example here, we're on MRC Global. Let's say that I want to go ahead and do a quick search for a six-inch steel elbow go ahead and execute that search, pull back in our results here for that steel elbow. And you can see, of course, when we got the results back in here, that this is understanding that search term. We provided six inches. And so we can see that this is an elbow six inches. We've got our 131 results here. Understanding the keyword searches, the, the attribution of the, the unit of measurement that this is a six inch uh, diameter uh, steel elbow that we're looking for. We've pulled back in the relevant results here. But of course, how someone might search on that unit of measurement might not be consistent. Six inches is kind of what might be in the data, but maybe a visitor might come to the site and instead search on a half foot steel elbow. 
And again, you can see that the autocomplete actually already suggesting the relevant results here. So we're doing that unit of measurement conversion here, even in the autocomplete experience. And if I execute that search for a half foot steel elbow, you can see that the results are going to be the same. We have the same 131 results that we did when we did that search for six inches, even though we used an entirely different unit of measurement of a half foot. So there's two things that are happening there. One, we understand the relationship between inches and feet. We know that within a foot, there are 12 inches. So if I'm searching for a half foot, that obviously means six inches. We're going to go ahead and obviously display the relevant results there. The search information management tool allows us to understand those relationships, and it does this in a programmatic fashion. If this is not building out a huge table of synonyms, this is not having to really completely change out the data that you have. MRC Global is providing the data of what we have around the, of what they have in their catalog. We're able to use our search information management tool to understand the various pieces of uh, unit of measurement that they have, and understand on our end programmatically what do those relationships actually mean. So I can use, like we saw earlier, six inches. I can do a half foot. That's a variation also of not just inches to feet, but also from whole numbers to fractions. Be able to understand that a half can be converted into six inches when we start thinking about that from fractions to whole numbers. That, of course, also means that we can do this as a decimal point as well. I can say that I'm looking for 0.5 foot steel elbow. We've now gone from a whole number to a fraction to a decimal point, and we still understand that relationship. We understand that if I'm looking for 0.5 feet, that obviously there are six inches within a feet, and then a 0.5 feet, uh, or I'm sorry, that six in, that 12 inches are in a foot, so 0.5 feet is going to be six inches, and we'll again see the same 131 results. And so this really just kind of streamlines the functionality, makes it something that it just gives us another way to really kind of help answer that question of if a visitor comes to your site and is doing a search, how can you make sure they're going to get the right results? What we've hopefully been showing you as we move through all these different sites, if we're talking about long tail keyword searches, if we're talking about part number searches, if we're talking about being able to do unit of measurement searches, that Honk Search can really help kind of tackle that. Then we start layering in the ability to do this kind of different segmentation, understanding where the visitor is, what warehouse they're associated with. Is there regional availability that we need to be concerned about? Searching behind the login, we can also help power here. Really just kind of a lot of core search functionality that Hawk Search can bring to the table. And with the SIM, the other great thing about this is that we can actually start to understand uh, not just unit of measurements between um, you know, six inches and feet, but we can do imperial to metric. So as a quick example, let's say I'm going to go ahead and do a search for a real broad search. Let's just do three-eighths of an inch. If I do that three-eighths of an inch, of course, we can go ahead and do that search, and we'll pull back in the results for that. We understand what that unit of measurement is. You can see here within the results, we've got 1,449 results being returned for that three-eighths of an inch search. Really broad search, though. But as an example here, to just show that conversion, uh, we've done this in the past here. So we know that if I want to go from three-eighths of an inch, uh, you know, as an inch to centimeters, I could also then do nine or 0.9525 centimeters. So we've gone from inches to centimeters. If I do that same search for nine for that vert, that value, you can see that we're going to have the same 100 or 1,449 results. So it really just keeps it consistent between what that visitor is searching on, understanding that that centimeters to inches conversion, that imperial to metric conversion, we can also help drive there. And it's not just the search box that we can help power there. So another quick example here, let me jump off of MRC Global to another client that is in the B2B space. They restock it. They work in kind of the office supply industry. So uh, janitorial equipment, uh, kitchen supplies, things like that. Uh, restock and had a very similar uh, problem where they had that unit of measurement conversion issue. So again, I can do you know, a search for a six inch food pan and I can go ahead and pull back in the relevant results for that. I can do a search for a you know, 0.5 foot food pan, and again, we're going to go ahead and have the same 28 product results. But what's interesting about what we've helped uh, restock it for is it's not just the unit of measurement conversion from the search box. We're also able to help use that SIM, the search information management tool, to help streamline their facets and filters. So one of the problems that we also commonly run into in the B2B space is that if we've got all of this various data that is kind of jumbled and that one vendor calls it, you know, six inches, another vendor calls it 0.5 foot, uh, you know, that also can influence how the facets and filters display. So as a quick example here, let me go ahead and do a, a search here for the term foaming soap. because This kind of lets us tackle a couple of different use cases all at once. When I do this search for foaming soap, we, of course, pull back in the relevant results for that search of foaming soap. Uh, what I want to quickly highlight, though, if I hover over this, you can see that this product is stored in milliliters. So again, the idea of imperial to metric here, we've got this item stored as 1,200 milliliters, and there's two per carton. Now, in the use case of uh, restock it, it's not just a matter of being able to convert imperial to metric, but also being able to understand what the package containers are going to be. This is listed as two per carton. Uh, some of these items are listed as a case of two or uh, being sold individually. 
Um, so we have lots of different variation within the product data that we have access to. Not only are we seeing imperial, uh, or I'm sorry, metric values that are being returned, but we also want to be able to understand what that unit of measure, I'm sorry, what the, the packaging containers are that we want to uh, display. And what I mean by this, if, and this will probably make a little bit of sense here if I show you over here in the left-hand navigation, we've got our units per case. You can see here for the units per case that we have uh, each, we have two, per, two to five per case, six to 10 per case, 11 to 20 per case. But again, if we hover over this, you can see that these products are stored in their data as two dash carton. So when I'm selecting two to five per case, what's actually happening here is this is using the SIM to understand that relationship, that if we're, the product says that it's two per carton, what that actually means from a fasting perspective is we wanna display the two to five per case as the value there. Really makes it streamlined so that we're not seeing per carton, per case, per unit, per package, per pallet, all being listed as values under the unit per case selection of a facet. We can standardize that, streamline it just like we do for the keyword searches. If I'm using unit of measurement of you know, inches or feet and then all having the same set of results, we can also standardize that then from the fast to say, well, we only want to display per case as our value and being able to understand all the variations of how that data might actually display. And of course, this does also mean that we can drive uh, unit of, I'm sorry, the selection for capacity volume. You'll notice that for the capacity volume, these are all listed as fluid ounces, not milliliters. So if I say that I'm looking for something like 64 fluid ounces to one gallon, not only are we going to display the relevant results for that, we understand that range value there, the 2300 milliliters of this value converts within that range of 64 fluid ounces to one gallon. But of course, we can also understand other abbreviations, other variations in the data, just like we showed you for inches and foot, foot being spelled out in full, inches being a double quotation versus being spelled out same kind of uh, functionality we can see here when I've done this keyword, uh, done the facet navigation to say, I only, I'm only looking for 64 fluid ounces to one gallon. We understand that this one GAL actually does stand for an abbreviation of gallon and are able to display the relevant results there. So really just kind of able to help tackle a lot of kind of the complexities that we see in the B2B space. One of the last examples that I have here for us today, I'm going to go ahead and jump over to another client of ours. STS Industrial, who is using Hawk Search for a couple of different things uh, as it relates to search. So again, all these functionalities, I just want to be kind of clear that we're talking about here. All of this is kind of improving the core search functionality. There's a lot more that Hawk Search can bring to the table in terms of recommendations and landing pages. And we'll kind of give you a little preview of that as we wrap up here. But the last kind of search focused functionality that I really want to discuss is for STS Industrial, how we're helping them with kind of the ability to, to group uh, products that are all similar. So that kind of parent-child relationship, another very common thing that we see in the B2B space. You might have one product that has a hundred variations with it, a thousand variations within it. And instead of displaying all of those variations instead of the results, Hawk Search can do the grouping of those products and display the parent versions of those while still being able to let the visitor refine within the experience. So here in STS Industrial, let's say that I'm looking for a, um, let's say I'm looking for like a hex nut. Again, you can see different terms of auto, different autocomplete from what we've seen on the other sites. Go ahead and pull back in our results here for that. And we've got in all relevant results for a hex nut, as you would anticipate there. Now, what's interesting here, and you can start to see this right away. If I go ahead and go into the material, you can see that we have 32 brass, 158 stainless steel, 706 steel. But if we look at the actual set of results, there's not 700 results that are being listed here. What Hawk Search is doing is we're going ahead and using the information from the, the client that says, hey, we have you know a hex red uh, rethread die nut. There might be a hundred variations of this one, but we're grouping them together so that as I make a selection, I say, you know, actually I'm look, looking for brass as my material. There's only two parent groups that have brass. Within and underneath these two, there are 32 variations within that. So if I was to go in and say, you know, actually I'm looking for that brass hex nut, this takes us into a product detail page that is again, leveraging Hawk Search to further the experience from the search per side. We've made that selection for brass, so you can see we actually carried over our breadcrumb functionality. We're now showing all of the relevant results for that hex nut, a brass hex nut, that, are, that match that criteria. So this is the children of that parent. And I can, again, use my fast and filters to further refine with that, to say, you know, actually I'm looking for, uh, let's say, uh, let's go with a width across flats. Let's say I'm only looking for the 5 16th here of two, make those selections. And you can see again that we've refined into it. So this works just like a search results page, but here we're only limiting our results to the parent product. So here are all the children from that parent of a brass hex nut. And the unique thing here is that you can see that we've only got two results now after having the material of brass and the width across flats listed as five sixteenths. But if I actually go back to our search results here, 
I can actually go ahead and make the same selections. These are the same facets that we saw on the product detail page. And that means that if I go into width across flats and make that selection for 5 sixteenths, we've built that out. We still have the same two results because both of these do offer a 5 sixteenths width across flats as, a, as, a, as, a, as an attribute. But if I go into our Brax hex, hex nut product again, you can see that we've actually just refined right into the same two products. So this is one way that we can really help kind of drive the, the what we call our SKU grid, basically, the, the understanding of parent-child relationships. You have products that have lots of different variation within them, and you want to make sure that when you're looking at a search result set, if we go back to that very first result there, we're not seeing 700 of the same SKU repeating over and over and over and dominating the set of results here. This is all being grouped up together and saying, here are all of the products, the parent products of those, and we can go ahead and use the facets and filters to let a visitor drive further into the experience and get directly to what they're looking for without overwhelming them with a number of kind of duplicated displays there. Really can help kind of improve the, the functionality that we see in terms of streamlining that customer journey. So that really kind of tackles a lot of the search functionality. There's a ton more that we could kind of talk about kind of from a, from a search perspective, from kind of how we can look at different facets and filters, how we can really kind of drive into your business. But I don't want to make sure, I want to make sure that we're not overwhelming everyone here with, with information. Really, this can sometimes be like drinking from a fire hose. With that said, though, we've really kind of focused on the search functionality because that is one of the key things that we want to make sure that we're helping address for the Salesforce B2B Lightning environment, how we can help tackle that. I do want to give you guys the ability to also see what else we can do for our clients here. So as a real quick example, I'm going to go ahead and jump over to Berlin Packaging again. We're going to wrap up the conversation here because there are a couple other things that we can do on this uh, that we can bring to the table for our B2B clients that we see a lot of uh, interest in when we start talking about things beyond the search functionality that Hawk Search can drive. So real quick example here, we can also drive our recommendations that we have here. So if I go into the product detail page here on Berlin Packaging, we are driving the recommendations from this experience here. The thing to highlight here about this example is that the accessories that we're seeing listed here, this is, of course, all being informed by the product information that we have as a data point. So any of that information, again, that lives in Salesforce, Hawk Search can have access to, we can use all of that data to understand the relationships between your products. So in this case here, I have a two-ounce amber straight-sided squat jar. Cap is not included. So our recommendations functionality is going to go ahead and make the suggestions for the relevant caps. Similarly, if we scroll further down here, we can also make suggestions for similar items. So what is similar to what I'm currently looking at. Again, using all of the data points that I have access to currently. One of the other things that we can help also drive beyond that search functionality and beyond the recommendations functionality is our, uh, our landing pages. We can help drive the category pages that you have available. A quick example of that, I'll actually jump over to restock it here for that example. On restock it, we've shown you the search functionality. We've shown you how we're helping drive that through the fasts and filters, how we're also driving the sim through being able to search on unit of measurements, but we are also tied into their category structure. So if I go into one of their top level categories, make a selection for furniture, this is actually going to be a Hawk search powered page. We understand what the facets and filters are under the furniture category because we have all that information already indexed. We can also then help drive kind of some of the UI elements that we have listed here of subcategory navigations using our recommendations again to say, well, what are the best sellers within this category? And as I continue to drill further into this, let's say that I am looking for uh, desks and risers, make that selection. This takes us further into the experience. Now we're actually pulling back in products like we would from a search results page. But again, this is all contained within that subcategory of products while still also displaying the subcategories here. So real kind of quick tease on some of the other functions that we can offer. Really want to kind of focus most of this conversation on the search piece, how we can help the Salesforce Lightning uh, B2B clients use Hawk Search to help really tackle a lot of that search pains that you might be having. But there is more that we can bring to the table in terms of recommendations and these landing pages as well. We're coming up here on the 45 minute mark. I want to make sure that we uh, give everyone a little bit of time here to digest all this information. So we're going to wrap this up. I appreciate everyone's time here today uh, in terms of joining us and walking through this presentation. Uh, if there are any questions, please feel free to reach out to us. We'd love to schedule a demonstration and, and kind of have a unique uh, demonstration provided for you that can really help answer any questions that you might have about a specific scenario or pain point that you might be having. Thanks for joining us today, uh, and we look forward to seeing you for the next webinar.